Revolting Rhymes by Raw Dahl Jack and the Beanstalk Jack's mother said, We're stony broke. Go out and find some wealthy bloke, who'll buy our cow, just say she's sound, and worth at least a hundred pound. But don't you dare let him know that she's as old as Billy O. Jack led the old brown cow away, and came back later in the day, and said, Oh, Mumsy dear, guess what your clever little boy has got? I got, I really don't know how, a super trade-in for our cow. The mother said, you little creep, I'll bet you sold her much too cheap. When Jack produced one lousy bean, his startled mother, turning green, leaped high up in the air and cried, I'm absolutely stupefied. You crazy boy, do you really mean you sold our daisy for a bean? She snatched the bean, she yelled, you chump, and flung it on the rubbish dump. Then summoning up all her power, she beat the boy for half an hour, using, and nothing could be meaner, the handle of a vacuum cleaner. At 10 p.m. or thereabout, the little bean began to sprout. By morning it had grown so tall, you couldn't see the top at all. Young Jack cried, Mum, admit it now, it's better than a rotten cow. The mother said, you lunatic. Where are the beans that I can pick? There's not one bean. It's bare as bare. No, no, cried Jack. You look up there. Look very high and you'll behold. Each single leaf is solid gold. By gollykins, the boy was right. Now glistening in the morning light, the mother actually perceives a mass of lovely golden leaves. She yells out loud, my sainted souls, I'll sell the mini. Buy your rolls. Don't stand and gape, you little clot. Get up there quick and grab the lot. Jack was nimble, Jack was keen. He scrambled up the mighty beam. Up, up, he went without a stop. But as he was near the top, a ghastly, frightening thing occurred. Not far above his head he heard a big, deep voice, a rumbling thing that made the very heavens ring. It shouted loud. Fee, fi, fo, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Jack was frightened, Jack was quick, and down he climbed in have a tick. Oh, mum, he gasped, believe you me, there's something nasty up our tree. I saw him, mum, my gizzard froze, a giant with a clever nose. A clever nose? His mother hissed, you must be going round the twist. He smelled me out, I swear it, mum. He said he smelled an Englishman. The mother said, And well he might, I've told you every single night, to take a bath because you smell. But would you do it? Would you hell? You even make your mother shrink, because of your unholy stink. Jack answered, Well, if you're so clean, why don't you climb the crazy bean? The mother cried, By God I will. There's life within the old dog still. She hitched her skirts above her knee, and disappeared right up the tree. Now would the giant smell his mum? Jack listened for the fee fo fum He gazed aloft. He wondered when the dreaded words would come. And then, from somewhere high above the ground, there came a frightful crunching sound. He heard the giant mutter twice. By gosh, that tasted very nice. Although, and this in grumpy tones, I wish there weren't so many bones. By Christopher, Jack cried. By gum, the giant's eaten up my mum. He smelled her out. She's in his belly. I had a hunch that she was smelly. Jack stood there gazing lonelingly upon the huge and golden tree. He murmured softly, golly gosh, I guess I'll have to take a wash if I am going to climb this tree without the giant smelling me. In fact, a bath's my only hope. He rushed indoors and grabbed the soap. He scrubbed his body everywhere. He even washed and rinsed his hair. He did his teeth, he blew his nose and went out smelling like a rose. Once more, he climbed the mighty bean. The giant sat there, gross, obscene, muttering through his vicious teeth, while Jack sat tensely just beneath, muttering loud, fee, fi, fo, fum. Right now, I can't smell anyone. Jack waited till the giant slept. Then out along the boughs he crept. 
and gathered so much gold I swear he was an instant millionaire. A bath, he said, does seem to pay. I'm going to have one every day. Revolting Rhymes by Roald Dahl Goldilocks and the Three Bears This famous wicked little tale should never have been put on sale. It is a mystery to me why loving parents cannot see that this is actually a book about a brazen little crook. Had I the chance I wouldn't fail to clap young Goldilocks in jail. Now just imagine how you'd feel if you had cooked a lovely meal, delicious porridge steaming hot, fresh coffee in the coffee pot, with maybe toast and marmalade, the table beautifully laid. One place for you and one for dad, another for your little lad. Then dad cries, golly gosh, gee whiz, oh cripes, how hot this porridge is. Let's take a walk along the street until it's cool enough to eat. He adds, an early morning stroll is good for people on the whole. It makes your appetite improve. It also helps your bowels to move. No proper wife would dare to question such a sensible suggestion. Above all, not at breakfast time, when men are seldom at their prime. No sooner are you down the road than Goldilocks, that little toad, that nosy thieving little louse, comes sneaking in your empty house. She looks around, she quickly notes, three bowls brimful of porridge oats, and while still standing on her feet, she grabs a spoon and starts to eat. I say again, how would you feel if you had made this lovely meal and some delinquent little tot broke in and gobbled up the lot? But wait, that's not the worst of it. Now comes the most distressing bit. You are of course a house park wife and all your happy married life. You have collected lovely things like gilded cherubs wearing wigs and furniture by Chippendale bought at some famous auction sale. But your most special valued treasure, the piece that gives you endless pleasure, is one small children's dining chair, Elizabethan. Very rare. It is in fact your joy and pride passed down to you on grandma's side. But Goldilocks, like many freaks, does not appreciate antiques. She doesn't care, she doesn't mind. And now she plonks her fat behind upon this dainty precious chair and crunch it busts beyond repair. A nice girl would at once exclaim, oh dear, oh heavens, what a shame. Not Goldie. She begins to swear, she bellows, what a lousy chair, and uses one disgusting word that luckily you've never heard. I dare not write it even hinted, nobody would ever print it. You'd think by now this little skunk would have the sense to do a bunk, but no, I very much regret she hasn't nearly finished yet. Deciding she would like a rest, she says, Let's see which bed is best. Upstairs she goes and tries all three. Here comes the next catastrophe. Most educated people choose to rid themselves of socks and shoes before they clamber into bed. But Goldie didn't give a shred. Her filthy shoes were thick in grime and mud and mush and slush and slime. We're still upon the heel of one with something that a dog had done. I say once more, what would you think? if all this horrid dirt and stink was smeared upon your eiderdown by this revolting little clown. The famous story has no clues to show the girl removed her shoes. Oh, what a tale of crime on crime. Let's check it for a second time. Crime one, the prosecution's case. She breaks and enters someone's place. Crime two, the prosecutor's notes. She steals a bowl of porridge oats. Crime three, she breaks a precious chair belonging to the baby bear. Crime 4. She smears each spotless sheet with filthy messes from her feet. A judge would say without a blink, 10 years hard labor in the clink. But in the book, as you will see, the little beast gets off scot-free, while tiny children near and far shout, goody good, hooray, hurrah. Poor darling Goldilocks, they say, thank goodness that she's got away. Myself, I think I'd rather send young Goldie to a sticky end. Oh, daddy, cried the baby bear. My porridge, gone, it isn't fair. Then go upstairs, the big bear said. Your porridge is upon the bed. But as it's inside, mademoiselle, you'll have to eat her up as well. <laughs>